This presentation is part of a lecture series on the C++ programming language by Michael Adams at the University of Victoria in Victoria, Canada. Uh, for those of you who might be interested, a copy of the slides for this lecture series can be downloaded from the website whose URL is given at the bottom of this slide. This presentation constitutes a work in progress. It's definitely far from perfect, but hopefully it's of sufficient quality to serve as a useful resource for learning C++. For the benefit of those of you who may be relatively new to programming, including many of my students, I'd just like to make a few comments regarding the examples that appear on these slides. Often, in order to make an example short enough to fit on a slide, it's necessary to make a lot of compromises in terms of good programming style. So some of the deviations from good programming style that are demonstrated by these slides are such things as uh, frequently formatting the source code in utterly bizarre ways in order to save space, uh, not including any comments in the code, using short meaningless identifier names, and so on. So these things are truly evil. Do not ever do them in real code, but understand that for the purposes of examples and fitting them on, onto slides, it's necessary to do some of these truly evil things. So in this part of the lecture series, we look at some of the concurrency features of the C++ programming language. We'll talk about things like uh, memory consistency models a little bit, go into uh, threads, how thread management, uh, sharing data, mutexes, condition variables, promises and futures, and atomics. Before entering into a discussion on concurrency, I want to introduce a little bit of background information. Some of this may be uh, material that you're already familiar with, but for the sake of some students who don't know, for example, what does multi-core mean and things like this, it's worthwhile to at least spend a few minutes to introduce some of these terms, just to ensure that everyone has at least a basic level of understanding of these uh, concepts. To begin with, I need to introduce some basic terminology. So first of all, a core or processor core is an independent processing unit that reads and executes program instructions that are stored in memory. It consists of some registers, an arithmetic logic unit, which is what performs computation, for example, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and so on. A control unit, which synchronizes all the activities of the core. And on any modern core, there'll also be a cache of some sort, which is important for performance reasons. And I'll have more to say about caches in a moment. A processor is a, com a computing element that consists of one or more cores. So we have our a collection of a bunch of cores, and together we call them a processor. A processor also has an external bus interface, so it can talk to the outside world, and typically a shared cache, which is a cache that's shared amongst the different cores in the processor. Next term I need to introduce is the notion of a thread. A thread is simply a sequence of instructions that can be executed by a core. And the basic idea is a core can execute at least one thread. If a core supports something called simultaneously, simultaneous multi-threading, it can execute multiple threads potentially. And in the simultaneous multi-threading case, the threads share the resources of the core. Now these days, most processors tend to have multiple cores, in other words, more than one core, and we say that such processors are multi-core. And multi-core processors are important because they can simultaneously execute multiple threads, so they're very well suited towards concurrent programming because they can do more than one thing at the same time, which gives you thread-level parallelism. Just a few more things about processors. If we have a multi-core processor and all of its cores are of the same type, we say it's homogeneous. On the other hand, if the multi-core processor has more than one type of core, we say it's heterogeneous. And you might be wondering, well, why would we want to have different types of cores on the same processor? Well, one reason for doing this is to provide different types of functionality. For example, we might provide a CPU core for doing general purpose computing and then a GPU core, in other words, graphics processing unit for doing hardware accelerated graphics. Another reason for having different types of cores is to provide different levels of performance. So for example, you might have a high performance CPU core, which can do a lot of computation per unit time, but it also consumes a lot of power, which if you're in a mobile application and you're running off a battery, this could be a big deal. And then in addition to that, you might also have a energy efficient CPU core, 
which can't do as much comp computation per unit time, but it doesn't use as much power. So if you're running off of a battery, the battery will last much longer. In, a, in mobile applications these days, you know, this is an important thing, battery life. Now I'd like to talk about the memory hierarchy that exists in a computer system. And the component of the system that stores program instructions and data is called main memory, which is this particular block in the diagram at the top of the slide. And then over on the very far left, we have our processor core, which is essentially the entity which is reading program instructions from memory and then executing those instructions, which causes it to read data from memory and also write data to main memory. And what's really important to understand about this picture is main memory is extremely slow compared to the speed of a processor core. So, for example, it's not unusual to see in the time that it takes to read some data out of main memory, it's not unusual to see a processor core have to wait, say, 100 clock cycles or more. And these days, most processor cores can complete one instruction per clock cycle. So if the processor core has to wait for 100 clock cycles, for example, this is probably 100 instructions that it, it would otherwise be able to execute, but it can't because it's sitting there waiting for data to come in from main memory. So in order to speed things up, what we do is we introduce caches. And what a cache is, it's a very fast memory that can be used to store copies of instructions or data from main memory. And, and it works as follows. The first time the processor core needs to read a particular uh, memory location into, uh, out, of, uh, out of main memory, it has no choice really other than to go out to main memory and, and re actually retrieve the value that's stored there. And this is extremely slow because main memory is very, very, very slow compared to the speed of the processor core. But what happens is when it reads that value, it remembers it and it, it stores it, for example, in the level one cache. And the level one cache typically will be on the processor core itself actually part of the processor core. And it, essentially what it does is it remembers that for a particular memory location it read a certain value. So if it tries to read that value again, instead of going out to main memory, it just goes, oh, I remember what it was last time I read it. It's the value that's stored in my level one cache. So I'll just read it out of the cache and it's very, very fast. So caching basically hides the latency of main memory and caches are essential for good performance in modern computing systems. Just a few more comments about caches. Uh, caches may, um, may be separate, in which case you have a cache for instructions and a separate cache for caching data, or they may be unified, in which case the cache handles both instruction and data. Um, also, caches can be local to a single core, or they might be shared between two or more cores. And as a matter of terminology, the core which is closest to the or the, sorry, the cache which is closest to the core is referred to as a, level, as a level one cache. And typically the level one cache tends to be actually on the core and local to that core. And then there might be a level two cache or level three cache up to the last level cache. These other caches typically will be on the processor but shared between two or more cores on the processor. And essentially as we move further and further away from the processor core going out to from the level one cache to the level two cache and so on, the further we have to go out to the right in order to access the data that we want to have access to, the slower things become. In an extreme case, we go to main memory. Well, I guess there's bulk storage as well, but bulk is a four letter word, so I'm not going to even talk about that at all here. And for the purposes of this discussion, really main memory is what matters. So the key thing to understand, caches are essential for performance and they greatly speed things up by hiding the latency of main memory. On this slide I have a few examples of multi-core processors. These three examples happen to be from Intel. The, the first processor that I have listed, it's used for example in the Lenovo W530 notebook. It's a 64-bit processor. It has four cores and it can run two threads per core for a total of eight threads. The next processor I have listed is a little bit uh, more recent and it targets desktops and notebooks. It's a 64-bit processor. It has eight cores and it can run again two threads per core for a total of 16 threads. And then the Xeon processor family is is targeting servers so it's, it's a more high-end application. It's a 64-bit processor. It has 15 cores and it can run again two threads per core in this case for a total of 30 threads. On this slide, I've listed some examples of multi-core SOCs. SOC is just an acronym for System on a Chip. 
The first example that I have listed is from Qualcomm. It's used in the Google Nexus 6. It's a 32-bit quad-core ARM-based processor. It also has a GPU as well. The next example I have is from Samsung. It's used in the Samsung Galaxy Note 4. And it has two quad-core ARM-based processors. And they're configured in a high-performance, energy inefficient configuration. So the first quad-core processor is high-performance. And the second one is ener an energy efficient core. So the basic idea is if, the, if you don't need to do much computation, you can shut down the high performance core and do the computation on the energy efficient core and save battery life. And we also have a GPU as well. And then the Apple A8, which is used in the Apple iPhone 6, for example, it's a 64-bit dual core ARM-based processor. And of course, it also has a GPU as well. So at this point, you're probably wondering what's driving the trend behind multi-core processors. So I want to spend some time to explain this, at least briefly. So in the past, greater processing power was typically achieved by increasing the clock rate of our processors. The basic idea being if you increase the clock rate, you can get more work done per unit time. But if you look at the trends in clock rate, since about 2005, the clock rates of processors ha have not been going up very much, and they've topped out at about 5 gigahertz. And basically what's at issue here is that power consumption, the, the amount of power consumed by the processor, grows approximately with the cube of frequency, the cube of the clock rate. So if you double the clock rate, the amount of power that's consumed by the processor grows by a factor of approximately 8. And this greater power consumption translates into increased heat production. And the problem is, if we increase the clock rates any more than, than we have already, uh, the processors are going to start overheating, bursting into flame, melting, etc. And obviously this would not be good. But independent of this, however, transistor counts are still increasing. There was a, a very famous observation made by Moore, which said that approximately every 18 months the transistor count doubles. So basically the number of transistors on a processor double approximately every 18 months. This trend is still continuing. Probably at some point we'll reach, uh, Moore's law will break down because we'll le reach the limits of what uh, physics allows for, but at least for now anyway, Moore's law still applies. So we can still put more, pro more uh, transistors on a chip and the significance of this is that we can then increase the processing power instead of by raising the clock rate by simply adding more processor cores. So if we have n processor cores running at a clock rate of f, for example, this will use significantly less power and generate less heat than a single core running at a clock rate of n times f. So Putting these facts together, going multi-core, the advantage that it provides is it allows for us to have greater processing power with lower power consumption and less heat production. So in the next few slides, I just want to give some basic uh, background about multi-threaded programming. So before I can really talk about uh, concurrent programming in any sort of meaningful way, first I need to introduce the notion of concurrency and a few related concepts. So the first concept I want to introduce is the notion of a thread. A thread is just a sequence of instructions that can be independently scheduled by the operating system. Threads don't exist by themselves. They exist within the framework of a process. So a process you can think of as a, like a program. It consists of at least one thread of execution, because unless you have at least one thread, you can't do anything because there's no code that gets executed. But in addition to one or more threads of execution, you also have some resources that are used by those threads. These resources consist of things like memory, in other words, an address space, any open files that they have, devices, network connections, uh, mutexes, other things like this. So this is what's meant by a process. And an important thing to understand about a process is if you have multiple threads executing all within a, a single process, all of these threads share the same address space. In other words, they all share the same memory. And I'll come back to why this is important a little bit later on this slide. The next concept I need to introduce is the notion of concurrency. 
Um, there's a lot of different definitions of concurrency out there and no one really can quite seem to agree on what the, the very best definition is, but this is my particular take on things. Uh, if, if during a particular period of time you have multiple threads executing, in other words, their execution is overlapping in time so that in a particular window of time you're doing multiple things, multiple threads are running. This is what's meant by concurrency. In other words, you have multiple things happening in a particular window of time. It doesn't necessarily imply that you're doing multiple things simultaneously. For example, if I have a single processor core that can only run one thread at a time, I can still have a concurrent system because I can use that processor core to switch rapidly between multiple threads. It can run one thread for a little while, then another thread for a little while, and switch rapidly between them. I'm never actually executing two threads at once, because I only have one core, so I can't do this. But in a given window of time, I'm executing multiple threads. So this is what's meant by concurrency. It doesn't necessarily imply I'm doing things simultaneously, but in a particular window of time, I'm doing multiple things. Then related to this concept is the notion of parallelism. And parallelism re refers to the situation where multiple threads are executing simultaneously. So in order to have parallelism, at least the type of parallelism I'm talking about here, you need to have a multi-core processor. You need to have multiple processor cores so that you can have multiple threads running at the same time. Or perhaps a single core which has hyper-threading or something like that. Now there's a number of different ways you can achieve concurrency. Uh, one way to achieve concurrency would be to have multiple single-threaded processes. So you have a whole bunch of processes and each one of them has a single thread. Another way you could achieve concurrency is you could have a single process which has many threads. And in practice of these two options, the one that is most commonly used is we have multiple threads running within a single process. And the reason for this, the reason why this is preferable in a lot of situations is because of efficiency. As I mentioned earlier on the slide, all threads that belong to the same process share the same address space. The, the reason why this is important is it means if you have threads all running in the same, running as part of the same process, because they share the same address space, it's very easy for them to share variables. If you have, you know, five threads running in a program in a process, and they all want to be able to access the variable x in order to share whatever data is associated with x, they can all see the variable because it, it it's. Uh, they can all see the, the memory where this variable is stored. It's shared between all of the threads. Whereas if you put all of these five threads into separate processes, they couldn't actually see each other's variables. It becomes more cumbersome and difficult to actually share data between threads that are running in different processes. Uh, essentially, you have to communicate this data between the, the threads in different processes, and it, it just tends to make things much less efficient. So I want to spend a little bit of time to introduce a, a concept known as a memory model or memory consistency model. And what this is, this is a specification of how memory interacts with your program. So when you read some location in memory, what is it that you actually are going to read? If you have different th threads reading and writing to memory, when you actually read something, what do you read? for example. This is essentially what's embodied in a memory model. It specifies sort of the rules for how memory is allowed to behave. And without a memory model, you don't really have a well-defined meaning to what the semantics of your program are. In order for a multi-threaded program to be able to look at the code and be able to figure out what it does, you need to know how memory behaves. So this is the, the significance of memory models. And memory models need to address issues, well, primarily two issues. One is ordering, and one is atomicity. Uh, atomicity is maybe the easier one to explain. An operation is atomic if it executes from beginning to end without uh, any other intervening things happening. So if you, a memory operation is atomic, if you try to read memory and the operation is an atomic operation, once you start reading that memory location, until you finish reading it, no other memory operation can come in and change the value or access the value that you're trying to access. Once you start reading it, you finish the read before anyone else is allowed to access that location. Or if you're writing that location, once you start writing it, until you finish writing it, no one else is going to be allowed to access that location. This is what's meant by atomic or atomicity. The other issue that memory models need to deal with is ordering. 
And this is maybe a little bit more subtle thing that you may not really have thought of. Uh, but if you have multiple threads that are running, for example, in a multi-threaded program, and some threads are reading some variables and some are writing you know, the same set of variables, you know, if you have one thread write the value of x and then another thread reads it, what value is it going to read? What, in other words, in what order do changes to memory become visible to the various threads in the program? This is what's meant by ordering. And the memory model affects primarily three things. The programmability, essentially how easy it is to write code. Some memory models are much more difficult to write correct code for than others. It affects performance. Some memory models will be able to perform much better because they're much more efficient and some won't perform so well. And also portability is affected by the memory model as well. I mean, depending on how you structure the memory model, it might not be possible to support that memory model on certain processor architectures if you're too overly strict about how the memory model has to behave. So if we have a multi-threaded program, something that's very important to know is what's the meaning of that program? In other words, when I run that program, what possible behaviors can it exhibit? What are the possible outcomes of running this program? How will it behave? And one important concept in this regard is what's known as sequential consistency. And the basic idea behind sequential consistency is if I have a program that consists of multiple threads, if the system that's running my program, in other words, the runtime environment, is sequentially consistent, if it has this sequential consistency property, what this means is the program is guaranteed to behave as if the instructions from the different threads simply interleave with one another. And probably this is best illustrated by way of an example. So on this slide, I have a simple multi-threaded program that consists of two threads. The code for the first thread is shown in the box on the left here. And the code for the second thread is shown in the box on the right. As you can see, it's a very simple program. Each of the threads just consists of two lines of code. And suppose that initially all these ver the uh, variables x, y, a, and b are all, uh, which are integer variables, assume they're all initially zero. If the system that's executing this program is sequentially consistent, then for example, the program might run in the following way. We, it might first run the first instruction from thread one, which is x equal to one. So it would run this line of code here. Then it might choose to run a, an, an instruction or a line of code from thread two, for example, y equal to one. Then maybe it runs another instruction from thread two, b equal to x, and then maybe it runs another instruction from thread one. So what you can see here is the instructions from these two threads are just interleaving with one another. But the critical thing here is that you're, the, one of the rules of the game that you can't break is you're not allowed to execute the instructions from a single thread out of order. So you notice here that in the, the order of the source code for thread one, x equal to one has to happen before a equal to y. And if you look at this sequentially consistent ordering of the program that we were just looking at, you notice that x equal to 1 clearly happens before a equal to y. I've also listed on this slide a few other possible sequentially consistent executions of the program. If the system is sequentially consistent, it might run the program in the, in the way that's listed here on the second bullet, or as the way listed in the third bullet here, for example, or as in the way listed in the last bullet here. And if you look at all of these cases more carefully, you'll notice that the instructions for the individual threads always appear in order. They, they, they have to run in the order they appear in the source code. But aside from this, the threads are allowed to interleave with one another in arbitrary ways. So this is what's meant by sequentially consistent or the notion of sequential consistency. And we'll come back to this at, at many different places later on. This is a really fundamentally important concept. If a system is sequentially consistent, this implies something about how memory behaves in that particular system. In other words, this implicitly defines a memory model, which is known as the sequential consistency memory model. And in particular, with sequentially, the sequentially consistent memory model, all memory operations are atomic. And this comes about because if you think about what sequential consistency is saying, it's saying that if you have multiple threads, you just pick 
an instruction to execute from each thread. You know, pick one instruction from thread one, then an instruction from thread two, maybe a few instructions from thread three, and you run each of them one at a time. So there's never multiple instructions executing simultaneously, which means that you can never have the possibility of two memory operations happening at the same time. Therefore, memory operations are always atomic. So sequential consistency implies, for example, that each write operation is atomic and becomes visible to all threads simultaneously. This also, the simultane simultaneity part is also implicit in the, the definition of what sequential consistency is. So if we have a sequentially consistent memory model, with, or sorry, with the sequentially consistent memory model, all threads see write operations on memory occur atomically in the same order, and this leads to all threads having a consistent view of memory. So for example, if you have three different threads in the, in the program, and they're all sharing a variable x, and then you ask the different threads, well, how did you see x change as, the, as you were running? And each thread makes up a list. Well, X was set to 1, then it got set to 5, and then it got set to 53, and then it got set to 42. If you have to ask each thread to put together a list of how it sees memory changing, all of the threads will produce the same list. They all agree about the order in which memory operations are taking place. They all have a consistent view of memory. And you might say, well, what's the big deal? I mean, why would they not have a consistent view of memory? Well, the reason why is because all of these optimizations, we have caches, store buffers, and so on, all of these things have the effect of delaying the visibility of results. When you store something to memory, it takes time before other threads will actually, that are running on different cores will see those changes. Now, sequential consistency, this uh, sequential consistency model, it precludes, or at least makes very difficult, many hardware optimizations essentially all the ones that we would want to do, things like store buffers, caches, out of order instruction execution, and so on. And also it precludes most useful compiler optimizations we'd want to do, for example, re reordering of loads and stores, which is a very common kind of optimization, which is intended to hide the latency of memory. Uh, so although the sequential consistency memory model is very intuitive, it is kind of easy to understand how things will behave, it comes at a very high cost in terms of performance. So in practice, no real world system is sequentially consistent because the, the inefficient or the efficiency is just too low. However, this concept is still very useful nevertheless, as we'll see later, uh, because it turns out by tweaking things just a little bit, we can have something which kind of looks very much like sequential consistency, but doesn't have all the high costs in terms of performance associated with it. So what I'd like to do on the next couple of slides is go through an example of a compiler optimization and show how performing a particular type of optimization, essentially reordering loads and stores, can break sequential consistency. So in this particular example, we just have a very simple single-threaded program. This, this source code for it is shown here. Uh, we have two integer variables, x and y, and they're initialized to zero. And in the program, we set x to 1, we set y to 1, and then we, we execute this code dot dot dot, which is presumably doing some kind of computation which depends on the values of x and y. And suppose that the compiler says, no, 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 I don't really want to run the code that you're giving me. Instead, I, I prefer to switch the order of these two assignments and instead have y equal to 1 appear first and then x equal to 1. In other words, instead of running the code that you've specified here. Instead, it wants to generate code which does what's shown in this second box. So notice the only thing that's changed here is now y is set to 1 before x, as opposed to above where x is set to 1 before y is initialized to 1. And then the code dot 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 is exactly the same. Well, hopefully everyone would agree that these two programs are going to behave identically because the dot 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 part of the code is the same in both cases and in each case before the dot 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 code starts executing x and y are both one so the dot 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 code is going to see the same initial values for x and y therefore it's going to compute the same values that depend on x and y when it's doing its job so these two programs are indistinguishable from one another in terms of the behavior in other words 
the optimized program runs as if it were the original program. It really isn't. The compiler has changed and substituted a new program for your program, a new and improved program, presumably. Uh, but you can't really distinguish the fact that it's actually running a different program. So what I'm trying to illustrate by way of this, this slide is just to show that in a single threaded program, because in this case we just have a single thread, we can reorder loads and stores um, without invalidating the sequential consistency model, at least as long as we take data dependencies into consideration. But what I want to show on the next slide that's coming up is I want to actually introduce a second thread into the program and then we can watch how everything starts to fall apart in terms of sequential consistency. So now we're going to take the example from the previous slide and we're going to add a second thread to our program. So we're going to go from a single threaded program to a multi-threaded program with two threads. And in particular what I'm going to do, I'm going to add a second thread which has the code that's shown here. The code for the first thread is identical to what we had before and the code for the second thread is simply going to check if y is equal to 1. If it is, it checks to ensure that x is equal to 1. You can assume that assert is similar to the assert in, in C++. It's just checking to make sure that the condition in, the, that in this expression is true. And if not, it will terminate the program with an error. Uh, I should probably point out this code here is not actually C++ code. It's, it's, I'm using syntax similar to C++, but I'm just trying to illustrate this in terms of a kind of a generic programming language which has syntax similar to C++. So suppose that uh, this program is running on a sequentially consistent machine. The claim that I'll make is that this assertion can never fail. The reason why is that in order to go and execute the code inside this if, in other words, in order to execute this assertion here, y must be equal to 1. Well, in this program we said that the, all the variables are initialized to 0. So the only way that y could be equal to 1 is if thread 1 first executed x equal to 1, then executed y equal to 1, and then at some point later in time then thread 2 checked to see if y was equal to 1 and then went into this if. But if things happen in this order, Notice that in order for y to be set equal to 1, x must already be 1. So if x is 1, then when we go into this assertion over here, the assertion that x is equal to 1 must be true. So in other words, the assertion can never fail. And as long as the machine that's executing this code is sequentially consistent, it's impossible for this assertion ever to be, to ever fail. It always will be true. Now let's consider the optimization that was made on the previous slide where the compiler says, well, I don't really like your code for thread one. I'm going to reorder the, these first two lines of code and make the y equal to one come first followed by x equal to one. So it's going to replace this code here by the code that's shown down below here. So we've just reversed the order in which x and y are assigned to. And the claim I'll make in this case is this will, will break sequential consistency. In other words, this program, this optimized program, will now have a different behavior, an observably different behavior from the original program. And in fact, in this case, in the case of this optimized program, the assertion over here can fail. And we're assuming that this, this second thread, the code, hasn't been changed at all by the optimizer. So the only thing that's changed by the optimization process is just the first two lines of thread one's code. So if we think about this, what happens when this optimized program runs, well, the only way we can ever go into inside this if statement is if y is equal to 1. Well, how could y be equal to 1? Well, thread 1 could run first, and we execute y equal to 1, and then just after thread 1 executes y equal to 1, we have the possibility then that thread 2 could test the condition if y is equal to 1, and because thread 1 just finished setting y equal to 1, this will be true. Then it goes into the assertion and checks what if x is equal to 1, but because we're assuming that the second line of thread 1 hasn't executed yet, only the first line is executed, this means over here the assertion is going to fail because x is initially 0. We said that all the variables are 0 when the program first starts up, so x will initially be 0 because it hasn't yet been set to 1. The assertion fails. So the key point to take away from this is the optimization that reversed the order of uh, these two statements, x equal to 1 and y equal to 1 in thread 1, changing these two lines to the two lines below here. In the single-threaded context, this didn't cause any problems. It didn't change any observable behavior 
that was different for the program when it ran. However, as soon as we introduce a second thread, then we run into problems because this new program will behave as if it's not being run by a sequentially consistent machine anymore, even though it is, but the compiler by doing optimization has created the, the impression that the system is not sequentially consistent. So this is just a simple example to illustrate how reorder, reordering loads and stores can cause problems with respect to sequential consistency. So next I want to consider a hardware optimization, something known as a store buffer. So first I'll begin by explaining what a store buffer is for those of you who might not be familiar with this. A store buffer is one of the very first optimizations that you'd want to add to a processor. Writes are, to memory are very slow, so you really don't want to have to wait for a write to complete before the processor can go on and do some other things. So basically what we do, if we're doing a write to memory, so for example, suppose that this processor core, it has some value stored in one of the registers, and then it wants to write that, the contents of that register out to memory into the variable x. When we have a store buffer, this is done in two stages. What we do is we first write the value of the register into a store buffer. A store buffer is basically like a kind of like a to-do list for the processor saying, I need to write the value of r to memory location x. And then what happens at some later point in time, the value that's in the store buffer then gets flushed out to memory and written, written into the variable x. So the important thing to understand here is that a write operation takes place in two stages when you have a store buffer. The first stage is you just transfer the value from the register into the store buffer, and this happens very fast because this is all happening within the processor core itself. And then at a much, much later point in time, the, because write operations are very slow, main memory is very, very slow. So at some very much later point in time, the value of R that's in this store buffer then gets written out to the memory location X. So this is what's meant by a store buffer. And again, it's a really critically important optimization to have in any processor. So now that we all know what a store buffer is, I'd like to go through another example and in this particular example, I have a multi-threaded program. It consists of two threads. The code for thread one is shown in the box on the left. And the code for thread two is shown in the box on the right. And essentially we have four integer variables, x, y, a, and b, and they're all initialized to zero when the program first starts running. And what I want to do is I want to consider what are the possible outcomes that can arise for the values of a and b when this program runs. I've listed a few sequentially consistent executions of the program here. So we're going to suppose that the program is being run by a sequentially consistent machine. And these are a few possible outcomes listed here. What I want to convince you of is that when this program runs, there's no sequentially consistent execution of this program that can result in both a and b being zero at the time when the program finishes. So let's actually reason through this and see why this is the case. In every execution of the program, one of two things must be true. Either thread one runs first, in which case x equal to one is going to be the very first thing that happens, or thread two runs first, in which case the very first thing that happens is y is going to be set equal to one. So either x equal to one happens first or y equal to one happens first. There's no other possibilities. Well, if x equal to one happens first, the claim I make is that b cannot ever be assigned the value of zero. Why is this the case? Well, if x equal to one executes first, this means when thread two later executes the line of code b equal to x, the value that's read for x here must be one. In other words, it can't be zero because we know that it's already set to one. So this is the reason why if x is equal to one executes first, then b cannot possibly be assigned zero. Now let's consider the other possibility. The other possibility, what happens if y equal to one executes first? In other words, what happens if thread two runs first? Well, if thread two runs first, then we're gonna end up with y being set equal to one. And then at some later point in time, then thread one is going to execute the line a equal to y. And when this line of code executes, the value that's going to be read for y here has to be one. It cannot possibly be zero. The reason why is we're saying, well, suppose that thread two runs first so that we know y equals to one, y is set equal to one is the very first thing that happens. This means that later, when we read the value of y here, we have to read a value of one, which is obviously not zero. And this is what 
the point of this bullet on the slide is saying is that if y equal to 1 executes first, then a cannot possibly be assigned the value 0. So if we put these things together, we said that either x equal to 1 or y equal to 1 must happen first. And then we said if x equal to 1 happens first, then b can't possibly be 0. And we said if y is equal to 1 happens first, then a can't possibly be 0. And because one of these must happen first, this means that a and b can never both be 0 when the program finishes execution. And what I want to do next is I want to say, well, let's suppose that we add a store buffer and watch how things break in terms of sequential consistency. So now what I want to do is consider exactly the same program that we had on the previous slide. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce store buffers into all of the processor cores that are involved in this particular example. So in this case, we're going to suppose that we have two processor cores to run each of the two threads in this two-threaded program. Processor core 1 is going to be executing the code for thread 1. So in this column on the left here, we have the code for thread 1 in the order it's executing. And then core number 2 is going to execute the code for thread 2. So the code in for thread 2 appears in this column here. And I'm going to say, suppose that the code executes with the precise timing that's shown in this table. So what you can see here is that thread one executes, starts to execute first. So the very first thing it executes is the line of code x equal to one and thread one. Because we have a store buffer, this isn't actually going to cause the value of one to be written into x in memory. If we look over here, these last two columns are showing the values of x and y that are stored in memory. You can see that after this line of code executes here, x equal to 1, this, we still have the value of 0 for x. The reason why is this write has just gone, gone into the store buffer, but it hasn't yet been flushed out to memory, to main memory. And then suppose that, that uh, while this write to memory is pending, so it's pending, it's pending, it's pending here, while it's pending, then thread 2 comes along and it executes its first uh, line of code, which is y equal to 1. What this is going to do is it's going to send the value of 1 into the store buffer. The store buffer is going to basically be told, please write the value of 1 to y. And then this is going to be pending. It's going to, because again, memory is very slow, it's going to take a lot of time for this write to actually flush out to memory. So we have it pending, there's no change, pending, pending, pending. For a long time, the value of y doesn't actually change in main memory. So suppose now, while this write of 1 to y is pending, it's pending, pending, pending here, then we come along in thread number 1 and we execute a equal to y. Well, what's the value it's going to read for y? You might say 1 because this thread here just wrote the value of 1 into y, but no. The value that would be read here for y won't be 1. The reason why is that the value of 1 has not been written into memory yet. Notice that the value of, of uh, y in memory is still 0 because the second thread, which is running on core 2, when it said set the value of y to 1, it's only in the store buffer on core 2. It hasn't actually yet flushed out to memory. So the value that's read here is going to be 0 still, the, the initial value for the variable in the program. So this line of code here is going to read a value of 0 for y. So essentially this line of code here for the particular timing that I've shown, it's equivalent to just saying a is equal to 0. Then suppose while well, we're still waiting for the value of x to flush out to memory, so, so we wrote a value of 1 to x, it's gone into the store buffer and we're waiting, 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 waiting for the value to flush out to memory. And while we're still waiting for that value to flush out to memory, suppose that thread 2 comes along and it reads the value of x. We execute the line b equal to x, this is going to read the value of x. What value does it read for x? Well, it reads 0. You might say 1, but no, it doesn't read the value of 1, it reads 0 because the, although processor core 1 is in the process of trying to write the value of 1 to x, it's still only in the store buffer. It's still pending. It hasn't actually written the value out to main memory. So the value that's going to be read by the other processor core, processor core 2, that's running thread 2, is the value 0. So this line of code here, for the particular timing that I've shown, is essentially equivalent to b equal to 0. If we look at what results at the end of this program, we're going to have the value for a and b both equal to 0. 
which we said is impossible if this program is run by a sequentially consistent machine. Uh, maybe I should finish off the example here. Um, just after this last line of code in thread number two executes, then finally the write operation completes, it gets flushed out to memory and then we get a value of one appearing in X. And then just after that, the write to Y gets flushed out from the store buffer in core two and gets appears in memory. But it was too late. The values of one that we wanted the wanted to be read didn't get read because they happened before the values got flushed out to memory. So we ended up with this strange behavior before we said that for any sequentially consistent execution of this program, we should never have A and B both zero. But this is exactly what's ended up, we've ended up with in this case is A and B are both zero. And this means that this system must not be sequentially consistent. And if you look at this more carefully, it's really as if the program is executed with this order that's shown here. In other words, it's actually as executed as if the lines of code in thread one have executed in backwards order, as if A equal to Y executed before X equal to one. And it's as if B equal to X in thread two executed before Y equal to one. So the store buffer due to the delays that it's introduced, because it takes time for the value in the store buffer to get flushed out to memory, that due to the delay it's introduced, it's as if some instructions have executed out of order. In particular, we end up with this kind of or equivalent ordering here, which is not sequentially consistent. So what I'm trying to illustrate by way of this example is that it's just a simple optimization like a store buffer can break sequential consistency. A fundamental property of sequential consistency is that all memory operations are atomic. The reason for this is that sequentially consistent machine essentially serializes all operations. So because of this, all memory operations are atomic. Atomic operations, however, require synchronization between processor cores. If you stop and think about it, if you want to ensure that memory operations are atomic and you have several different processor cores in the system, any time that a processor core wants to access a memory location, it has to somehow broadcast to all the other processor cores the fact that it's about to access that location and say, hey, everyone, please don't access this location. I'm about to access it and I want my operation to be atomic. And then after it finishes, it has to tell all of the other processor cores, hey, I'm done. It's okay to access this location now, if you like. So there, there's synchronization, basically communication and coordination that's required between the different processor cores in order to uh, implement atomic operations. And this incurs overhead which means that atomic operations are going to be slower than regular op memory operations, memory operations that are not necessarily atomic. So requiring all memory operations to be atomic is not necessarily a great thing from a performance point of view. Really, we'd like to try to make as few memory operations atomic as possible in the hope that we can maybe gain something in terms of efficiency. However, because uh, fundamental to sequential consistency is the fact that all memory operations are atomic. If we decide to drop this requirement that all memory operations have to be atomic, this sort of fundamentally means that we're going to be uh, giving up sequential consistency. If we drop the constraint that all memory operations have to be atomic, in other words, we allow for the possibility that some memory operations are allowed to be non-atomic operations, then the possibility exists for something known as a data race. In order to define the notion of a data race, I first need to introduce the, the notion of conflicting memory accesses. So if we have two memory operations and they access the same memory location, and at least one of the memory operations is a write operation. So you have two memory operations involving the same location in memory, and at least one of them is modifying that memory location, then we say these memory operations conflict. That said, I can introduce the notion of a data, or the, the uh, definition of a data race. And if you have two conflicting memory operations, they form a data race if they're from different threads and they can be executed at the same time. So a data race essentially of a situation where two different threads are accessing the same memory location at the same time and at least one of the threads is writing to that memory location. 
And a program with data races is generally very undesirable because it will tend to have unpredictable behavior due to torn reads and torn writes and so on. To give an example, I have a multi-threaded program that consists of two threads. Uh, the first thread has this code associated with it shown in the box on the left. Thread two has the code associated with it shown in the box on the right here. In this uh, example, x, y, and z are all non-atomic integer variables that are shared between the two threads and they're initially zero when the program starts. This particular program has data races on both the x and y variables. In the case of x, if we look at what can happen here, there's the possibility that exists that when thread 1 is writing the value of x on this line here where it says x equal to 1, x equals 1, there's the possibility that thread 2 could be executing this, this line of code here where it's reading the value of x. So there's the possibility thread 1 could be writing x while thread 2 is simultaneously trying to read the value of x. So we have a data race on the x variable. We also have a data race on y because there's the possibility that while thread 2 is writing the value of y on this line of code here, y equal to 1, there's the possibility that while that's happening, thread 1 could be executing this line of code here where it's reading the value of y. So you have the possibility thread 2 could be writing y at the same time thread 1 is reading y. So we have a data race on y. The variable z, however, doesn't participate in a data race in this example. Although there's the possibility that thread 1 could be accessing the variable z, at the same time, thread two could be accessing the variable z. The key thing to note here is that neither one of the threads is actually modifying z. In other words, not, neither one is writing to z. Therefore, the memory operations are not conflicting because the, for a data race, you need to have at least one thread actually modifying the value of the memory location that, that's involved. So in this case, there is no data race on z. So one situation that can arise when we have a data race is what's called a torn read. And what a torn read is, it's a read operation that due to lack of atomicity, the read operation starts, it's read part of its value, but before it has a chance to finish its job, another memory operation comes in, a write operation, writes to the same location and changes the value. And this is maybe well illustrated by an example. So suppose we have a two byte unsigned integer, a big NDN byte ordering, so the most significant byte comes first in memory. We have our integer variable x and it's initialized to one, two, three, four in hexadecimal. And consider the following situation. We have two threads and they're going to be performing non-atomic memory operations that overlap in time where thread one is going to read the value of x and overlapped in time with this, thread two is going to write the value five, six, seven, eight in hexadecimal to x. So what we have initially is x is just equal to one, two, three, four. So byte zero of x is going to have the value one, two, byte one will have the value three, four. And then suppose things proceed with the following timing. Thread one, first of all, reads the first byte of x, which is one, two. Then before it has a chance to read the second byte, thread two comes along and it writes the value five, six, and seven, eight into the first and second bytes of x respectively. So we end up with x now having the value five, six in the first byte, seven, eight in the second byte. Then after this write completes, thread one then has a chance to finish its read operation. It comes along and reads the second byte of x, which now has the value of seven, eight, because we have seven, eight now in this byte. If we now look at what thread one has read for the value of x, it's read the value one, two, seven, eight. It read one, two for the first byte here, and then it read seven, eight for the second byte here. So we, overall, we have the value one, two, seven, eight read from memory. But notice that one, two, seven, eight corresponds neither to the old value of x before it was written by thread two, because the old value was one, two, three, four, nor does it correspond to the new value that was written by x, which is five, six, seven, eight. It's actually the value that was read for x by thread one is actually a mixed up, muddled up combination of the old value of x and the new value of x. And this kind of torn read uh, situation is often very undesirable to have in code because it essentially causes you to read values out of memory that looks sort of random. It's neither an old value or a new value that's there. It's a mixed up version of old and new values, which often will sort of behave almost as if they're like random numbers which generally leads to bad things happening in code. 
Another type of situation that can arise when we have a data raise is what's known as a torn write. And this is essentially a write operation that due to lack of atomicity, it's only partially written its value at the, at the point in time where another concurrent read or write operation on the same location is performed. And this can result in weird sorts of things happening. And this is probably best illustrated by way of an example. So suppose we have a two byte unsigned integer variable x, uh, big endian, so most significant byte is stored first in memory, and it's initially zero. And suppose we have the following situation. We have two non-atomic memory operations that overlap in time. One is performed by thread one, which is writing the value one, two, three, four into, in hexadecimal to the value, variable x, and thread two, which writes five, six, seven, eight to the variable x. And let's assume, it, and we, we're assuming initially that x is zero. So initially x is zero, so we have zero stored in both bytes of the integer variable x. Then suppose thread one comes along and it writes one, two to the first byte of x. So then we have one, two, zero, zero stored in memory. But before thread one is able to finish and write the second byte of x, suppose thread two comes along and it writes five, six, and seven, eight into the first and second bytes of x. Then we have five, six, and seven, eight stored in x, as shown here. Then after this, thread one, which hadn't quite finished writing the value of x, it now writes the second byte of x with the value three, four which changes the second byte to the value three, four. So what we end up with in the variable x after all is said and done is we have five, six, three, four stored in x. In other words, this value here. But notice that five, six, three, four is neither of the values written by thread one and thread two. Thread one wrote the value one, two, three, four, and thread two wrote the value five, six, seven, eight. But the value that actually got written when all it said, was said and done was neither value. It's actually a mixed up, muddled up version of, of part of the value that was written by thread one and part of the value that was written by thread two. And again, this sort of behavior is often very, very undesirable because it, it essentially behaves almost as if you're starting to write random values into variables in your program, which will generally lead to bad, very bad things happening. At this point, I'd like to pause and summarize some of the key points from the earlier slides. So what we've seen so far is from a programmability standpoint, sequential consistency is extremely desirable because it allows us to very easily reason about the behavior of a multi-threaded program. In other words, it allows us to be able to deduce fairly easily what a program might do when we run it. Unfortunately, as we saw on the earlier slide, sequential consistency also precludes most useful optimizations. For example, compiler optimizations and hardware optimizations we like to do, they tend to break sequential consistency. Furthermore, sequential inconsistency sort of has embedded into it the fact that all memory operations are atomic, and this also has a cost associated with it as well. So we're in a bit of a dilemma. On the one hand, we really like sequential consistency because it, it's easier to program for this model than other possibilities. But at the same time, there's a significant cost associated with it. So how do we resolve this dilemma? Well, one way we can resolve this dilemma is to use a, a particular model called sequential consistency for data race free programs, which is known by the acronym SCDRF. So the basic idea with SCDRF is we say, first of all, we're not gonna require that all memory operations have to be atomic. So because of this, it means we can have data races. And then what the SCDRF model says is that as long as you give the system a program that does not have any data races, in other words, it's data race free, the system will promise that your program will be run in a way which is indistinguishable from being run on a sequentially consistent system. So the subtlety here is that the system is not actually sequentially consistent. An SCDRF system is not sequentially consistent. However, as long as your program doesn't contain any data races, there's no way for you to detect the fact that the system is not sequentially consistent. In other words, the only way for you to know that there's sneaky, sleazy things going on under the covers where the system is really doing weird stuff and it's not sequentially consistent at all, the only way that you could detect this is if you injected a data race into your program. That's the only way you could observe this weird stuff going on. And because this particular model forbids you from doing this, it says you have to give me data race free programs, you can never detect this. And as a result, your program will always run as if it's being run by a sequentially consistent system. But the key thing to understand is it's not really sequentially consistent. It's only because of the fact 
that you're limited in which programs you're allowed to run. You're basically not allowed to run any programs that would behave in a non-sequentially consistent manner. In other words, ones that have data races. And although it maybe at first at first it might seem like, wait a minute, we're now having to impose this, this constraint that we can't have data races in our programs, but this is actually not really much of a burden at all because data races are probably not a good idea to have in your code in the first place. They're likely to result in bugs, so we probably don't want them anyway. So it's actually quite a reasonable constraint that we have placed on us that in return for something that appears to be sequentially consistent and it can be op implemented efficiently with lots of compiler and hardware optimizations, the only price we pay is we, we're not allowed to have data races. And several programming languages use the SCDRF model as the basis for their memory model, including C++, C, and Java. Our main interest here, of course, is the C++ language. So finally, coming back to C++, the C++ programming language employs as its default memory model the SCDRF model, in other words, sequential consistency for data race free programs. Again, with the SCDRF model, a program behaves as if it's being executed by a sequentially consistent system, provided that the program has no data races. That said, C++ does have support for other more relaxed memory models. By more relaxed, I mean they make fewer guarantees than the SCDRF model. Uh, they tend to be more difficult to use correctly and one has to be very careful when using them, but they're there for efficiency reasons. Sometimes efficiency may dictate uh, using some of these more relaxed memory models. Uh, in C++, the way that the language deals with data races is it says if you write a program with a data race, the behavior of your program is undefined. In other words, you're invoking undefined behavior. So when you're writing multi-threaded programs, you want to make darn sure that you never have any data races, because if you do, you don't know what your program is going to do because the behavior is undefined. 